Okay, so um, I want to give you a little presentation on this paper, and I think it will hopefully be interesting to you, give you an idea of how we approach these, but also give you an idea of what to focus on when you present. Um, I'll start off with a little anecdote. So this is the backup background reading textbook we're using. And uh, one of my ideas for the cover was a diagram like this, which is in the style of the Richardsons. They invented this kind of drawing of proteins. Jane Richardson is very famous for that right now. Uh, the publisher thought it was too painterly. Although to us, these pictures of molecules on the cover of Science and Nature are kind of a little cliche. So we didn't use that, but I want to mention this way of drawing was invented by Jane Richardson when she was trying to visualize protein structures. I think it would have been a great cover. Uh, as you know, I wanted to then use this version, uh, protein design for dummies. They didn't like that and they chose this one instead, which you've seen. Um, when we're live, usually there's a chuckle at this picture. I assume that you're chuckling and I just can't hear you. But I'll mention that um, the only time it doesn't evoke a chuckle other than via Zoom is when um, I'm giving a talk at, for example, the University of Maryland. And it turns out that there's a guy there in College Park who actually writes these books. Great university, by the way, I had a great visit. So I, I showed this and then no one laughed at an audience of 200. And finally, I found out at dinner that there's a guy who writes these books. So they didn't think it was a joke. They thought I'd actually written a book called Protein Redesign for Dummies. But, but no, um, actually, this is the cover instead. So there you have it. So be careful of the jokes that you tell. All right, so again, this is mostly chapter 11 of the book, but also the original Mayo paper. We'll try to read those in Paris for a little while. Okay, let's see. Um, I'm told my internet connection is unstable. So maybe I will pause this and see if I can connect a little bit better. Let's try this one instead. Might be a little pause here. In order to deal with these problems that we're having, I actually have four ISPs at my house. Um, and uh, in order to uh, be able to connect to work and other things. And uh, I use different ones to, for different tasks. Can you see that now? Yep. Good. All right. So let's go. What are we doing in protein design? We had this slide before. So, you know, you can think of uh, protein structure prediction as being going in the from the top to the bottom of the page. We have a sequence of amino acids that predict the structure. The structure is important for function. Protein design is in some sense, although this is not precise, the inverse. We start with the desired structure and we ask what set of amino acids will fold up into that structure. Really interesting questions. It's a combinatorial problem, right? How we could put 20 different natural occurring or proteinogenic amino acids in any position. And from a chemistry point of view, there's a the backbone, which aside from tr cis trans isomerization, is the black part that's fixed. And then the variable part, which are these side chains here, which could be, you know, small as alanine or as big as phenylalanine or something even bigger. And we do a search over what amino acids go there and over all their shapes to find something that will fold up to this shape here. Um, so we're going to study that problem a little bit today in this classic paper by Steve Mayo and the student who started um, Protobit with him. All right, so what are some basic you know, way, ways of thinking about this? The first is the concept of rotomers, rotational isomer. So basically the idea is if you imagine looking at an amino acid and going up the backbone and measuring these dihedral angles as if it was a robot, these chi angles, you can draw this in a space chi one and chi two, there are only two for phenylalanine. This is a toroidal space, it's like video games, you go off the end and you come back. So 360 is identified with zero degrees. And this diagram could reference, could represent calculated energies, which should be low, or they could represent statistical observation of these rotomers in a database, or they could actually represent empirical calculations by NMR. And of course, you can either have, um, you could select the lowest energy wells like here for discrete points, or you could subsample like this for this tyrosine and have a bunch of points here instead. So the idea of all these problems, and this is fundamental, is to take a continuous problem and somehow transform it into a discrete problem that can be handled by a computer. And one way to do that is to say that low energies correspond to frequently observed states, or you look at the raw statistics and where do these rotomers occur, and we'll just design for points like this instead. 
So that's the concept we're going to do to model the configuration space. Another thing that's very important, and we'll come back to this again and again, is the notion of what is our model of what we're trying to compute. And many of you had questions about this, very good questions. In fact, outstanding conversation on Piazza from all of you. You should feel very proud. On the left, I've had this computer science terminology for what's going on. On the right, the biophysics or biochemistry terminology. So in you can basically have sort of two choices. Is you can ask, given a, that you have a set of structures, a distribution of possible structures that you're predicting or designing, do you pick just the best one? And that's called maximum likelihood. Or you do some kind of average. And this is more like kind of a Bayesian calculation, right? Use of an average of those confirmations, whatever that means. Now, in biophysical terms, these have a precise analog. The maximum likelihood or best solution here is, it can be thought of as um, uh, taking a minimum energy, like a minimum over a set of confirmations. And the, if you will, the average corresponds to something called a partition function. Basically, we move back and forth between probability and energy using the Boltzmann distribution and take some kind of sum or average over these things. And this is important for stability and binding. So we look at just the best one and look at some kind of average instead. I see there's a question from Joey, or from Joe, sorry. Um, I, I just wanted to ask, so if you if you empirically kind of create that sort of heat map, which maybe you assume is like um, the energy landscape. This one? How, yeah, how, how do you, I guess for a given Rotomer, like what's the reference class that you choose from to kind of sample different Rotomer angle combinations and things like that? Yeah, it depends on it depends on your degree of sampling. And in fact, I, I actually favor a continuous distribution. So uh, here are three choices. One, just pick one in each energy well. And that's like the level at all uh, model. Another is to pick something that's more fine. So you might pick, um, uh, you know, nine points, you know, three on each side squared. That would be finer. And a third possibility is to treat this as truly continuous. I'll deal with that a little bit later in class, but basically what we say it's basically related to the concept of robust versus brittle optimization in uh, computational economics is that there's some variables we can control, like which well are we picking? Are we picking this one or are we picking this one? I hope you can see my mouse there. Once you pick the well, you allow the system to optimize within its free parameters to choose where it wants to be in this box. So I actually think the best representation of Rotomers is more like the biophysical one where you're picking an energy well, that's a discrete choice and then what you're doing with the algorithm is you're saying, I want to consider that entire continuous region. So you can have any sampling here, so to speak, up to continuous, but you need some techniques to make the continuous computation trackable and not just by sam infinitely sampling. So the whole choice of Rotomer libraries is a whole subfield of protein design and protein structural prediction, somewhat, I think, obsoleted by the use of continuous Rotomers because then you're just picking wells instead. Maybe that helps for now and we can come back to it a little, a little bit later. Is that okay, Joe? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Good, happy to go into it. And I'll, so catch me offline or by Piazza, I'll send you a couple of papers on this topic, which is a very good question. All right, so do we pick just the, the GMAC ID optimal or do we pick some kind of uh, use of distribution where these things are interconverting? That's really the key question. Um, and I'm gonna come back and look at the data from the paper, but first let's look at the method. All right, so I'm gonna switch, switch to, uh, a PDF here. So one reason I wrote this by hand is I wanted to tell you that, yes, I'm sure you'll use PowerPoint, but the point is to get the information across and not use all of PowerPoint's weird features and bulleting and auto content wizard. The point is to kind of make a good presentation that explains the idea. So I've done a lot of this by hand, not that you should necessarily do it by hand to show that you can get it across um, a very nice presentation, in my opinion. Uh, you can tell me what you think uh, using other methods. Okay, so here's the outline. I'll talk about the algorithm. And I think the main thing we want to concentrate in a paper like this is what is the algorithm? And then we'll talk about the results. How does it work? Hopefully satisfying both the computational and the experimental people in the audience and making a marriage between them. So again, the What's been going on here is very interesting, right? Usually we, you know, have a clone and we express and purify it and we solve the structure, or computationally we predict the structure for the amino acid sequence. This is a very different question, is that 
you're given basically the backbone as input. That's the primary input to this algorithm is what is the backbone of the protein? No side chains, just what should the backbone atoms do? And then you're asked what amino acid sequence should you use that should fold up into that safe, that, that, that's, that shape when experimentally verified. All right, so let me show you got the game here. The input would look like this when rendered. What does the backbone look like? The output is discrete. It's a set of n positions, sequentially oriented, each one being an amino acid, that would correspond to the thing that you actually make and express using biotechnology and characterize. Now, uh, this could be hard. So for example, uh, you know, how do you do this? So anyone recognize what this protein is, by the way? Any guesses? So this is a human glutaridoxin one. It's a analog of a uh, protein finding, found in vaccinia virus glutaridoxin, which is actually a bioterrorism uh, uh, target, a target to prevent bioterrorism in smallpox. Um, so one of the things you might want to do with this is design a protein that had never been seen before. But what Mayo decided to do is, well, what if we tried to design a fold that we know actually could happen, right? Just to see if we can do it, like computationally. And of course, we know a sequence that folds up to that. We've solved that by crystallography. But wouldn't it be interesting to see if we could have an algorithm design the sequence to fold up to that space? And maybe it would be the same, and it's possible. It'd be the same as wild type, or maybe it would be different. So it's kind of a remarkable thing. So again, the input to the algorithm are the backbone coordinates. I'll be more specific about this in a moment. Um, and those are the backbone coordinates actually from a known structure, right? Doesn't give it the sequence, doesn't tell it what amino acid, and you position just what are the coordinates. And the output is a sequence, in this case, FSD full sequence design one. And the hope is that it folds up into the right shape, which I've kind of drawn as a cartoon here. So kind of how does the algorithm work? I mean, at a high level. So it considers pairwise interactions and single body interactions. So side chain and backbone and side chain and side chain, right? So just two body interactions, even though they can be higher. And it has a potential function, which is a sequence scoring function based on the structure. Right? We'll talk about that in a minute. It was evolved quite a bit. And of course, during the, you know, you, you, you know, it's searching over basically uh, sequences, but each sequence can have a different shape in terms of rotomers. This is not an accurate picture of rotomers. This is a theoretical histidine on a backbone. It's not a rotomer because all rotomers basically share the, share the same vector, C alpha to C beta. But I've drawn it like this to show potentially two different shapes. So actually, this could be a combination of a backbone move and a rotor move, but two different shapes of these things. So, and one of the things about this algorithm is that it actually convolves two concepts, one the choice of amino acid, one and the other the choice of shape or rotor. So for example, rotor one could be this confirmation of histidine, rotor two could be this confirmation, rotor three could be a phenylalanine, rotor four could be a leucine, and so forth. So it's one of the few examples of abstraction in biology where we go up to a higher level to abstract something. There are a few more, but generally bio biology is pretty um, specific. And the search is, it's worst case brute force, but you can prune these possibilities using a very clever technique called dead end elimination. And let me say that until three years ago, dead end elimination, although it's a very interesting algorithm provable, was never taught in computer science classes, even though it's just as interesting as all the stuff you guys learn, like red black trees and ABL trees and all that kind of stuff, it's extremely interesting, has provable properties. Only recently has it been used in actually computer vision for a totally different set of problems because Markov random fields came into computer vision. So we'll talk about that algorithm a little bit, which is the heart of this paper. How does the algorithm work? Now, um, finally, what does it mean to input the backbone coordinates, right? I have to tell you what that means. So they tell you this in the paper, and I hope you read it. Um, so you can put the coordinates to these atoms in the backbone. And um, then we do some stuff with figuring out what kind of amino acids go where. Now, I can draw you pictures of peptide geometry like this, but I think I'm given the background of the class, what I'd like to do is review peptide and protein geometry and names of atoms a little bit so you can really understand what the input is and we'll use that throughout the term. So with your permission, I'm gonna to go to a document camera where I will draw on paper a little bit. Um, I have another question on rotomers before you yes. move on. Sure. Um, so I'm Grace. I was the one who said on Piazza 
I was talking about witness rotamers and I think I didn't fully understand it correctly. So would you mind just giving a brief explanation of what exactly a witness rotamer is? Yes, but yes, I'll do that later. Absolutely good question. I'll do that later when I talk about the data elimination algorithm. Okay. There's nothing fundamental about witness rotamers from the point of view of biophysics. It's only used in the context of the algorithm and only used as a metaphor from uh, actually cryptography to explain how the algorithm works. So there's no concept in biophysics, biochemistry, structural biology of a witness rotamer. It's just a purely algorithmic concept, although a very important concept. And I will definitely get to that when I do dead end elimination. And if it's not clear after that, please ask again. Okay, cool, thank, thank you. Great. Thank you, Grace, great, great question, of course. All right, so let's go to uh, document camera. Okay. okay. All right, so let me just, I mean, I wanna tell you when I say that we, input all these different backbone coordinates. What does that actually mean? That's like just do a little either reminder for some of you or introduction for some others of you about peptide geometry. Let me draw a piece of a protein. I mean, I'm gonna say peptide because it's small, but really this is how kind of proteins are named. So let's start out like this. So I'll start with the nitrogen, hydrogen, carbonyl carbon, oxygen, nitrogen. Uh, no, what do we want to do here? Oh, that's our C alpha, right? And we have H, N, C, O, C alpha, C beta. Let's go down here. H, N, C, O, C alpha, C beta, and so forth. And I'll orient you to this a little bit. This should be a C alpha, that's not a nitrogen. Okay, now, this is basic standard peptide backbone. Let's orient to what's going on here. Now, here we have these double bonds, and these double bonds have a, a character that propagates to this bond. It's sometimes called in resonance. So you're in resonance between double bond here and a double bond between the carbon and the nitrogen. Um, so in effect, this entire setup here has a double bond character. So to a first approximation, this is a planar set of atoms, right? And this is a plane here. These are called the peptide plane. And these guys here are planar as well, because the double bonds keep things in plane. Now, they're not exactly planar. So you could do experiments with NMR, even by crystallography, you can find that, for example, the amide bond here typically can be is pl in plane, but can be out of plane by up to seven degrees. But to a first approximation, these things really do um, live in a plane. And so in some sense, we have a kinematic linkage where a bunch of planes that are strung together by dihedral angles. And those dihedral angles have names. This is the phi dihedral angle. This is psi. And this is, again, phi. This is psi. And this is um, again, phi here on psi. Um, and the dihedral is, angle is measured down here uh, across this bond. And of course you can number them at the ith residue that you would have psi i and phi i. And now we have side chains extruding beyond here. So for example, this is a side chain here, and this is a side chain here, and this is a side chain here. And they can be either long or short. So the side chains can be as long, as short as a glycine, just one H, in which case there's actually no C beta here. And they can be a little bit longer for an alanine, CH3. They can be really quite complicated like a phenylalanine like this. Right, in this case, they have two dihedral angles, chi one and chi two like that. And of course their configuration space can be thought of as a square like this with chi one being here, chi two being there. These edges are identified, these edges are identified. So the configuration space of the phenylalanine rotamer is actually a torus because you identify these edges, you get a cylinder, identify these, you get a torus, the surface of a donut looks like this. So our surface of the torus here like this, which is S1 cross S1, a point here represents a rotamer in some sense. So. And of course you have proline as an exception, which links back to the backbone. But this is roughly the geometry of most amino acids and proteins. 
And the key thing here uh, from our point of view is realizing that if you want to specify where the atoms are in the backbone, at least, you could do that by the angles. You could say you have a mapping that takes in uh, phi one, psi one for the first residue, phi two, psi two, the second residue, all the way up to the end, phi n, psi n, and it maps this to some configuration of all the atoms in three-dimensional space. And of course, there are m of them, and that's not because you have side chains as well. And of course, you need all the chi angles to get the, get the side chains. So when we talk about what the algorithm is actually doing here in terms of its input, it's taking uh, coordinates of some of these atoms, right? Not all the hydrogens and stuff, so it's taking the coordinates, if I recall correctly, of the, um, this pen, of the nitrogen atom, carbon, here, the oxygen, and the C alpha atom, and it only takes this vector. It takes the vector from C alpha to C beta, right? Which direction is it pointing? And it uses that to do this. So that the input to the algorithm are the coordinates of nitrogen, carbon, carbonyl, C alpha, the C alpha, C beta vector repeats. So the input is the geometry of the backbone of the protein that you're trying to, um, that you're trying to design, right? You're trying to design a sequence to. So in some sense, the picture is just right because you're trying to decide what side chains do you put here? That's the main differentiation of amino acid in order that it folds up. And of course, the, let's do our example. This of, course is, this of course is a glycine. This is an alanine. This is a phenylalanine. If you want to think about it. Now there's a lot of detail here. And of course, you know, I've memorized it having worked in protein chemistry for a while, but I'm going to give you a mnemonic and in this course, and possibly afterwards, if you say this to yourself in the mirror every morning when you're brushing your teeth and once again at night, you'll remember it and then you'll never get confused about protein geometry. And you'll also know a little bit about NMR, which I will start covering next class. And the mnemonic is this, H-N-C-O-C-A-C-B. Looks a little strange here. It corresponds to walking down these atoms here. And the reason is that early NMR programs used Fortran, so they didn't have subscripts or Greek letters. CA is sort of Fortran or file name language or Unix language for C alpha. CB is Fortran or Unix language for C beta. And CO means carbonyl. And this means starting here, HNCOCACB, HNCOCACB, HNCOCACB. This is also the name of a very famous pulse sequence in NMR. It used to be the ho ho ha ha pulse sequence because they used to name them in cute ways after the authors and it had four authors, Hoffman, Hochschorn, Hoffman and so forth. That was thought to be too cute. So now they name these after the magnetization transfer pathway. And as we'll learn later, there's a pulse sequence that starts with the amide proton transfers to the an M15 uh, labeled nitrogen, then through the carbonyl without using it, to the C alpha, to the C beta, and back. So it correlates the spins of the amide proton, the amide nitrogen, the alpha uh, carbon, and the beta carbon all together in one experiment so you can see what's connected to what. Because in NMR, all measurements are referenced to a particular frequency, and each atom to a first approximation has its own frequency. So we'll cover NMR later. Don't worry about it. But this is the name of an experiment. And if you memorize this, HNCOCACB, you'll always be able to draw your peptide and never get confused. And so to practice, because you've already brushed your teeth this morning, you can say it with me now, HNCOCACB, 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 and we're done. So that's basically what I wanted to cover on peptide geometry, so you can know what are the atoms, what are the coordinates of the atoms that are being input in this case. Um, any questions on this before we go back to the paper and the algorithm? Um, um, I had a question on sure. the input of the algorithm. I, I think I might have just missed it or something, but like I understand the sequence of the the atoms, but uh, would the input be like the phi and psi angles or? So what from our, yeah, that's a great question. So from our point of view, it's important to realize that the phi and psi angles up to you know, kinematic symmetry would determine the conformation. But in fact, they're just inputting the 3D coordinates of the atoms, the desired 3D coordinates. 
So basically these things are all in space. I mean, in this case, they're in the pain. So, you know, this nitrogen here has three coordinates, X, Y, and Z. So you input, input the actual 3D, 3D coordinates for the model. So same as a PDB file. Does that help? Okay, thank you. Yeah, Absolutely. that makes sense. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, this is a really basic question, I think, but um, are the, the beta carbons uh, just representing the different possible side groups? So it's, a it's sort of a stub here. I wanted to draw peptide geometry and see, show where the side chains would be. And they would, they would be here, right? So the beta carbon actually only applies to certain amino acids. It doesn't apply to glycine, which doesn't have a beta carbon. I don't really think of it as applying to proline, although it does because it loops back. But all of the other 18 proteinogenic naturally occurring amino acids have a beta carbon there. An example would be alanine, where the beta carbon is this guy here. And it would be phenylalanine where the beta carbon is there. This is the alpha carbon here, right? So basically 19 of them do if you include proline. So it's, a, it's sort of a generalization of what, what you'd have for a side chain. So it's just showing the first, it's just showing the first carbon in the chain. All right, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Other questions? All right. So this is helpful, I think, for us to be able to understand what is being input by the algorithm. Um, let's go back to the, uh, go back to the uh, presentation here. Let's shrink that back down, come back over here. All right, so now you see what it means. I mean, you saw what we saw before, but I mean, you have a slightly better idea perhaps of what it really means to have, um, well, let me turn my camera back on. A little tiny button. So when they say that the input coordinates for um, N, C alpha, carbonyl carbon, carbonyl oxygen, and the C alpha, C beta vector, you see explicitly what this means in terms of my previous diagram, right? And you can even see it on this little example here. It means coordinates of this, 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 and this vector. All right. Now, this is a combinatorially very expensive algorithm, right? And for that reason, one of the things that makes it expensive is the number of huge number of choices you have to consider. So this algorithm attempts to reduce the complexity by saying you're only gonna consider certain amino acid types in different parts of the protein, which you know the structure of that you're trying to design. Now, this is a limitation that has been moved beyond in more recent algorithms. It's not really part of the algorithm. A lot of the questions was, does the algorithm do this? Does the algorithm have a core? Does it have a boundary? This isn't really algorithmic. This is more like model selection. The algorithm is really dead in elimination. But let's talk about what they did. Um, basically, based on the structure, you could partition the residues in the desired structure. Or residues don't have an amino acid type yet into core boundary and surface. Basically, you draw the solvent accessible surface of the protein, and you, which is a surface, and you look at the orientation of the C alpha C beta vector relative to that surface. Just a point in or out. It's a dot product of the normal of the surface and C alpha C beta vector. And then, based on that, you can classify core boundary and surface. The core has mostly hydrophobic amino acids. The surface has mostly polar or at least water tolerating or loving things, and the boundary could be either one. And if your phi bond angle, which I drew before, is greater than zero, you only allow a glycine there. So this is just a way of reducing the complexity. One distinction between bioinformatics and computer science is that someone in bioinformatics might think this is part of the algorithm. Computer scientists would just say, that's just a decision that was made. It's more or less ad hoc. There's some biophysical principles, but this is not even computer programming, really. It's the way to set up the input. It's clever. It made things work, but this is not sort of fundamental, especially because we can move beyond this. And at this point we can have a uniform energy function that um, can actually address boundary core and surface, but it wasn't used in this particular example. Okay, um, let's move on. Now, again, the scoring functions have progressed a lot, but a lot of the features that we see in these early algorithms, uh, you know, still hold today. So this is a potential energy function, right? Uh, and they use a different 
scoring function in the core of the surface and the boundary. Uh, the core uses van, a model of van der Waals interactions. It's an approximate model. Van der Waals for the first approximation in the, you know, if using quantum mechanics is actually a 912 potential. It has a component basically or a basis that's proportional to one over the radius between the nuclei to the ninth and a, another one that's uh, one over the radius to the 12th. But in molecular modeling, they make that minus six and minus 12 because you take the potential and you can square it. So it's just an approximation. They have salvation in there. Basically they reward or bury polar versus nonpolar surface area um, that's exposed or not exposed as it should be. Uh, the surface, they have a uh, hydrogen bond term. They have van der Waals. They also have a propensity or secondary structure. And on the boundary, they um, have some combination of the two. They don't say in the paper. One might ask, is it some linear combination of core plus surface? We don't know from the paper. So one kind of cool thing about this, and I'll say more about the energy function in a minute, is that it's physically based. Like it isn't the most modern quantum mechanical physics, but it's based on an understanding of physics, Coulombic point charges, van der Waals interactions, steric interactions, repulsion, salvation, hydrogen bonds. And to me, when I read this paper way back, it was extremely exciting and still is because I basically view protein design as an AI problem. You know, I got my PhD in an artificial intelligence lab, the AI lab at MIT, and in those problems, they're basically two components, two very hard components. And one is characterizing the constraints. And the second is searching for a solution that satisfies the constraints. And this shows that the representation of the constraints, the representation of the physics is good enough that a rather brute force algorithm can come up with things that actually work in the lab and make sense empirically. So this was really a turning point in this field because it shows the representations, although primitive by today's standards, are good enough that you can have a fairly straightforward algorithm that um, can search for solutions. Now, you maybe feel unsatisfied because I haven't told you that much about the energy function, which we will study later. And indeed, the paper doesn't really either. They have references. If you, however, that, and, and in those days, you didn't have to for these papers, right? And you didn't have to release your code. This is all changing now with open source science. This paper couldn't have been accepted now without exposing your code and letting people run it. We know what the scoring function really is because they have a series of patents on these that you can look up. And the patents on these tell you more or less precisely how the scoring functions work because they have to be specific. So they have disclosed it in order to patent it and you can look up the details, but this is all we really need for today. And we'll come back to energy functions later. So a simple model, things have improved a lot, but it was adequate to this problem. And many features of these models are similar in modern models of energy functions as well. The heart of this paper is the dead end elimination algorithm. And it's not the choice of polar versus nonpolar amino acids. It's not the core versus the surface. It's not what happens at the boundary. That's all really part of the, you know, how the algorithm is used. So, I want to tell you how the algorithm works. And this is described in the footnotes and the appendices and earlier papers. But let's sort of walk through it and see if we can understand how this works. And I think this exercise is a good way to think about how you could do your presentations. So yeah, there's a description, but can you really tell us how this works? And that's you know what I'm going to try to do today. Grace, I see you have a question. Yeah, um, so in the paper, they seem to emphasize a lot that um, this was like the biggest motif that was able to fold on its own without disulfide bonds or metal binding. And I was just kind of wondering why that was relevant. They seem to repeat it a lot. I don't know if it has to do with like that complicating the simplicity of the whole folding thing with hydrophobicity and hydrophilicity, um, but I was just wondering why that's relevant. Yeah, so... It's a strange, well, so they didn't, they didn't want to deal with disulfide bonds. Uh, we can model them now, but they didn't want to. They can model cysteines. Um, a biggest motif is kind of a strange terminology. I really like this paper, by the way, because it's kind of like the biggest small thing. So motif is like a fraction of a protein, right? Um, and so uh, 
I think they wanted to pick something that was simple enough, but also small enough that they could design it. So they're talking about something that has, they're basically, I think, saying that it has real biological complexity, but at the same time, um, they didn't have to model really hard things like disulfide bonds and metal ions and things like that. Got it. Okay. They're trying to say it's a good test case. And by the way, I think this paper is brilliant. I think this is a landmark. I think these guys, you know, deserve the Nobel Prize for this. Uh, in saying that there's been progress in the 20 or 30 years since, that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing, right? But I'm, still, we can talk about the algorithm and how it can be extended. So, great, great question. Thank you. All right. So, you can think of the dead end elimination criterion as a kind of predicate, like a thing that says yes or no. So, I'm going to modify the notation here. And of course, I've drawn, notice I've drawn rotomers the way rotomers really aren't. I've had them, I've drawn them like this even though they actually share a C alpha C beta bond vector. This position I, we're considering, so what we're considering here is we have rotomer T at position I, like T might be phenylalanine MTT, right? And we're considering putting, sorry, it might be histidine, we're considering putting this phenylalanine rotor there, there instead. So we're making a choice between TI and RI, or putting T at I or R and I. That's our choice. We're trying to decide which is better, right? So how do we do that? So we want a condition that says, can I look at a relatively small number of things and have a condition that says you can prune RI. In other words, never consider again whether R should be at I in all your computations, like prune it like you prune a branch in chess. You're playing chess with me. If you immediately sacrifice your queen, I'm like, you're gonna lose, right? Don't do that. So you're looking for conditions like that. It says, don't lose your queen. Don't put RI there. We'll tell you yes or no. And the way to think about this, we, you know, we want a condition under which we would not want to put RI there, right? So the condition might work like this. We prune RI if there exists some competitor here, T, that's in some sense better. So what is that going to mean here? So one way to think about this is that the only way that a rotomer can be better is in terms of energy. So in biophysics, the currency by which everything is compared is energy, more or less. So you have to convert all these comparisons to energy. So what can we have? We can have which energy is better, T or R at position I versus each other with respect to the backbone here, like interchange here. And also we can imagine some possibly far away, some possibly nearby rotomer at position J called S. So we imagine the position J, imagine S being there, and we can look at the energy of S at position J with respect to each of these choices. So we call S the witness, that's just a name. Um, I'm actually the first to use that term, but it's a standard term in computer science. And the idea is that we not only ask what fits better there from the perspective of the local backbone, we ask what's better from the perspective of a witness. The only perspective the witness can have is energy. So we compute these energies and ask which is better. So as we're considering switching from R and I to T and I, we're going to have some kind of equation that has different things in it. It's going to have some local penalty for switching from R to T and I that involves side chain and backbone interactions. And we're going to have some side chain, side chain interactions. We're going to say, what is the penalty from switching from RI to TI from the perspective to S at position J, namely SJ, right? That's what we're going to have those two things there. Um, now, it's going to look something like this, and I'll try to parse it for you. So the first part is relatively simple. Remember, the only perspective, only evaluation we can do is energy, and lower energies in biophysics are better. So we're minimizing energy. So the penalty for switching to Ri from Ri to T, Ti, or R to T at I, is going to be a subtraction of the one body energies, E of Ri minus E of Ti. So this says which is better from this perspective down here. Now, what does it mean to ask if it's better with respect to other things? And here we can break it down. So suppose we fix position J and we have already fixed I and we're going to actually fix what rotomer is at J as well, which is called S. That's what's in parentheses here. So again, this is the penalty for switching from R to T at I from the perspective of rotomer S at position J. And that's just the difference of the two body energies here. I've overloaded E to be either one body or two body energies, but that's an easy thing to do. So this is the perspective. This is S at position J telling us what he thinks 
about whether or not we should choose R or T at position I. But the problem is, and this was actually mentioned in the comments to some extent, is we don't know what rotor mer is actually at position J because we're designing that at the same time. So why not consider them all and take the minimum? That's the minimum penalty. So that's the minimization here, the minimum looking at all possible rotomers S that can go in at position J. And basically at position J, we'll have a lower bound on the RI to TJ penalty. So that says, if you fix position J, you don't know what you're gonna design there. What's the penalty? What's the smallest penalty you could have? Now, once we have that, we can consider all positions and we can sum this, letting J vary like this. That's the sum here. So this is your condition, right? We have a lower bound on all the things that could happen at J. We sum those over all positions. We have all possible penalties. So if you can, you can prove then that if this is positive, then we can absolutely uh, prune Ri and never consider it again, because Ti will always be better. And this is the first form of the dead end, elim dead end elimination or DEE criterion. And the key thing about this is it's been extended and multiple times in multiple cases, but just understanding this one simple case helps us give intuition about how the system works. And you can see why we really need pairwise decomposable energy functions so we can do the one body, two body calculations. I'm gonna go into this in a little more detail. But this is the kind of level of explanation we're trying to get. All right. Um, any questions before I go on? I'm going to talk about complexity, among other things. It's a little bit mind bending at first, but it's like algorithms you see in search, like branch and bound. And this is basically just an exposition of what's described in the footnotes and end of the paper to describe how the algorithm actually works. So, what's pretty cool about this is it's actually provable. Like in the model, you can show that you can always get rid of R, R and I if this condition holds under your model. And in biophysics, sometimes people think it's all this kind of computing and optimization, but this is actually a provable condition. Paul, you had a question. Yeah, so if this, um, if this uh, minimization equation is, is able to work, does this mean that like the energy of, or at least if not the energy of the entire protein, at least the energy of like the energy difference between R and T can be comprehensively determined by just the pairwise energies um, like of T and S, J and, and R and S, J. You wouldn't have to consider like T and S, J and, you know, S, K or like any, anything other than pairwise interactions. That's a great question, Paul. Let me try to answer it as follows, and you tell me. So basically, if this condition is true, it's more like a bound. So if this condition is true, then what we've done is we've proven, or the algorithm has proven, that R at position I, or Ri in our terminology, cannot participate in the GMAC. Like the GMAC cannot have R at I so we can rule it out from consideration. So it's a very narrow thing that's being asked. It's not really being asked to characterize energy gaps or differences or anything like that. It's just being asked, can our RI participate in the GMAC? Tell me if that makes sense and then I'll go on. Yeah, that makes sense. Like I kind of think of it as like, almost like Pareto optimality. Like you're showing that it's in a way Pareto suboptimal or like that it must be to you know, something else. Yeah, there's no Pareto notion here, but it is, it is uh, suboptimal for sure. So you're showing it has to be suboptimal. But in answer to your question, and I'll briefly talk about this in the future, um, in some sense, this is the smallest version of the DE condition. Um, and what we're doing is there are more sophisticated pruning conditions that involve more than triples. And they prune more, but they're more expensive. And I'll go into that complexity trade-off. So you can look at, say, a fourth residue, say, position Q at position K, and ask for that interaction, and you get a more complicated formula, and the formula is more, pruning is more expensive, and moreover, you will prune more in general. So there's a trade-off there. 
I see there are a couple of other questions. It just tells me there's questions. I can't see who. I know Joe had a question. I was just a little bit confused. Let me know if you want to move on because we maybe could discuss this during recitation. But um, I understood Paul to be asking whether it's possible, for example, that you could have uh, a rotima at uh, K, um, which in conjunction with some rotima at J produces a kind of a more favorable energy with RI than you would expect just on the basis of RI's pairwise interactions with just uh, a rotomer at J or just the rotomer at K. And I, I, I didn't I, understand your answer because... I see your question. With a pairwise energy function, no. With a real energy function that can have n body components, yes. Right, so it is just, it's just, it's provable assuming the simplification as it were. It, assuming that you have a pairwise decomposable energy function and you're using it here, absolutely. Right. Got it. If you have a if you have an energy function that is higher order, then you can't. So with a pairwise energy function, you can have a higher order pruning that will prune more but be more expensive, still using the same energy function. But we're still assuming everything is sums of one body, two body energies. And of course, there are higher order energy functions, but they're not applicable here. Now the the framework can be generalized to that as long as it has bounded arity, um, although it's more expensive. And, and the various things you can do, but we're just looking at the simple model of it being pairwise. So because it's pairwise, that, that can't happen. And what and it is just, it that, is just- That was my question, so thank you. Rob, sorry, thank you for explaining, Joe. So yeah, if you had a higher, if, I mean, that's, that's just the energy function isn't right, right? But if it's pairwise decomposable, then this is provable. Right, and, and, so, and what are the bodies in this case? Because it seems intuitive that like, we're talking about one rotomer and another, but like- The residues. There, right, but are there also potentials in this model or in other models between individual atoms and like, depending on the bonds or the dihedrals or the angles and things like that? You, you, have, you have potentials between atoms and potentials for the dihedrals, but they're decomposable at the residue level. So they're summed together, but they're in groups. Right, and, yeah. yeah, that makes sense, thanks. And then the ones that are in the same residue are called intra and the ones that are between are called inter. Right. I see there was another question, but I didn't see from whom. Is it from um, John? Yeah. Hi. Uh, so I have a question. So I understand like why here, like doing this two body thing is applicable, but like doing like a higher, uh, you know, order consideration would be like computationally intractable. But I just wonder how realistic is it? Like is this assumption here? I, I, I assume that there is an assumption that uh, like, most contact between residues here are actually two body. And if there are like three body, four body contact, they're, they're relatively rare and they can be modeled as the sum up of like the, the, submit, the sum of like two body interactions. Is that right? I, I just wonder like how prevalent it is like, like in protein structures that multiple residues are actually interacting with, uh, with each other in a manner that it should be considered uh, in the algorithm. Yeah, so you can you can have multiple interactions if they're, if, I mean, in this algorithm, although they're so pairwise decomposable. So you can have, you know, A interacting with B, interacting with C, interacting with D, and all the pairs interacting. The assumption is that the energies can be modeled by some of those different pairs. Um, so multiple interactions is possible, but pairwise decomposable is assumed. You're asking, is it accurate? Uh, the answer is in, in no way is it accurate. It might be accurate enough for protein design. So this is just our first, I mean, so we can do a couple of things, although not in this lecture. We can generalize dead end elimination to high order energy functions as long as it has a bounded arity, like two body, three body, four body, something like that. We can fit two you know, energy functions that are pairwise decomposable to, um, uh, pairwise energy functions as an approximation. Um, we can throw pairwise energy functions out the window. And that means that our algorithms will now be linear in the size of the confirmation space and linear in the size of the sequence space. Um, and so we have, we have a number of options. We can also re-rank things later using a better energy function. But think of it as, a, think of it as an approximation. And if you are very experienced and want to think of it as a course approximation, 
I have no problem with that. Um, it's uh, just a kind of first step. So think of it, you know, when you when you're in high school and you teach you mechanics, you know, they teach you rigid bodies and Coulomb friction and Newton's laws. We know that's just an approximation. And later you learn about relativity and impact and deformation and uh, general relativity and quantum mechanics. This is our our, fir our first model, and you can still make useful predictions in some sense, but it's definitely not what happens in physics. Okay. And we'll we'll explore some of that later on. Okay, thank but you. But I'd say it's surprising you could do as much as you can with it. Um, and it's also surprising, I'm all for better physics, but it's surprising that in most people's hands, the better physics doesn't really help protein design that much without a lot of thought about the algorithm. Um, so we could go, in, I'm not saying it can't be done, but it requires some careful, careful thought. So yes, much more can be done even at a practical level. Yeah. All right, so let's, um, let's do a little more thinking about this. Um, so those of you who haven't thought about, it, I want to motivate complexity theory, kind of a strange name in a way, right? Because, you know, as I teach in 230, you know, an algorithm that's really complex could have a fast running time, but a super fancy complicated algorithm might have um, you know, very fast complexity, but it's very time intensive algorithm, especially in 1997, even now. So we want to understand why it's slow and find faster algorithms. So let's kind of look at the, uh, Algorithm a little bit. So obviously, you know, I've sort of indicated this would be exponential, but there's kind of a surprising thing. Again, and you could do this for your papers, you could actually analyze the complexity of these algorithms rather than just, I mean, in some sense, I hope you'll find it a little bit unsatisfying to ask me a question like, is this practical? Is this too slow? Is this intractable? And, and I say yes or no. And then there's an oracle, namely your professor telling you what's possible and what's fast and what's slow, but you can actually compute these yourselves part of the analysis we do when we present these papers. Let's do a little simple analysis of how fast this is. And as pointed out from these very practical questions, it's absolutely crucial to consider how fast this will be, how does it run? Um, so let's have some notation here. Uh, let's let n be the number of residues in our target protein. That's pretty cool. And let's, um, let's uh, let r be the number of rotomers that can be at any one position. Now I'm gonna express this as a predicate. Think of DEE in this first line as being a predicate that returns true or false, given the input of RI and TTI. So in other words, you give it RI and TI, it says yes or no. So again, we have to look at the actual expression, which is here, and see how that, how that actually works, right? Actual picture. So I'll draw it like this. So the time just to check, if you've given me RI and TI, right? How fast can I compute this equation, right? Let's, let's look at it, right? I have to look at this thing here. I have to compute all these different terms here. So I've got a min, I've got a sum and so forth, all that kind of stuff. So the time to actually compute if Ri can be pruned if in favor of Ti, is Ti always better? The minimization takes time order R. We have to look over all rotomers and the sum of the min takes time n times R. So you could compute this predicate pretty quickly, linear time in N and R, the product of N and R. Now, a more interesting question is, can we decide if there exists some rotomer T that would be better? So here we knew T, we just asked. So now I can search over all rotomers T, see if I put them at I, can I prune? And here I have to do this step, but multiply it by the number of rotomers, R times step A. So that's now order Rn squared. Now, what I want to do is I want to find uh, all possible uh, rotomers, right? Like not just one, but all of these guys, right? I want to look at this guy so that I can, um, uh, you know, I want to find what are the rotomers here that can't be pruned. So this tells me whether or not R can be pruned for a particular R, but I'd like to find the set of all rotomers that can't be pruned. You see the difference? Step three is saying, hey, you know, Paul, if I put a phenylalanine here, is that a bad choice? And it'll say yes or no. Paul will run his algorithm in quadratic time and he'll say, Bruce, you can always prove that a phenylalanine is bad there. This is saying, well, okay, Paul, I get it. Absolutely. What's the set of rotomers I can put there that won't be pruned, that, that can participate in the GMAT? So you have to take this step and run it for each rotomer. So that's R times 
the complexity in B, now I'm up, up to n times r cubed. Still polynomial time, getting worse. But for protein design, I now want to enumerate for each position, what's the set of rotomers I could have there. So position one, what's the set of rotomers? Position two, position three, and so forth. So I have to run this through all n, and that takes time n squared r cubed, still polynomial time. So here's the really cool thing. Dead end elimination, everyone says it's kind of expensive. But in fact, I can enumerate a representation for all consistent sequences, all sequences consistent with the GMAC in polynomial time. This is amazing. And that's the power of the pairwise model. That's where you're getting it. So I can enumerate for each position, what's the set of possible amino acids and rotomers I could put there that are compatible with the GMAC are not incompatible with the GMAC. Now I haven't enumerated a particular sequence, it's all consistent things. So this is like a, a menu in a restaurant, right? You know, one from column A, two from column B, three from column C. So I have like appetizer, main course, dessert, right? Um, so now I have shown that in polynomial time, this criterion can enumerate a representation of all sequences consistent with the GMAC. However, and this is where things get bad, if I want to score all those sequences, I have to enumerate them. So the number of sequences is, of course, R1 times R2 times Rn. That's exponential in N. I have to enumerate them and then score them with my energy function. So scoring these sequences can take exponential time, at least naively. So the remarkable thing about dead end, el dead end elimination, or DE, it's actually a fast polynomial time criterion that lets you design consistent sequences with the GMAC i.e. pruning inconsistent sequences. What gets you, the hard part of protein design is enumerating sequences out of this list. Again, one from column A, one from column B, one from column C, and then, then scoring. And you can score them in constant time, but still, that's the hard part. So enumeration is hard, but computing a consistent representation actually is polynomial time is actually fast. Okay, this is a pretty remarkable thing. And you can show this, it's not obvious, but we can have just proved it in some sense. So, um, you know, you can, the criterion is very powerful in this sense, getting all the possible sequences compatible with the GMAC polynomial time, scoring them apparently exponential time. You have to prove a lower bound to get that, but we can, we can do that. All right, so this raises the problem, and I think this is the duel to the problem that's being answered by my colleagues and students in the class. Can you some just factor scoring? Like, could I could I score on this subspace and this one, and then somehow combine them? If I could do that, right, I might be able to come up with a faster solution. And to do that, you could still use the two-body energy function, but use more witnesses. So, in other words, I could do dead elimination. Is R worse than T from the perspective of S and Q? Like, you got a second witness, kind of like a lineup, right? But this guy says, "Yeah, I saw him, officer." And this one says, "Yeah, he ran down the street." So using this, I could prune more. But of course, the dead elimination criterion goes up. It has bounded degree if you only have a fixed number of witnesses. But still, the complexity of pruning goes up, but the size of these sets goes down. So you have a trade-off here between making the enumeration faster versus the dead elimination slower. Finally, to get below exponential time, I actually have to, have to drive these sets to one, right? Because if you have two there, then you have two to the end, which is exponential. So it's kind of difficult to do. All right, so I've done a bunch of things here. And what I want to mention is that um, I did all this just reading this paper, right? I know some other things, of course, and I can answer questions about how does it extend all the great questions we had about n body energy functions and solvent and so forth. But all this stems from the paper. So this is the kind of analysis you can do. And later we'll talk about the experimental validation as well. So to conclude the methodology here, I would say that what's pretty cool is this is physically based, right? The potentials are at least based on some understanding of physics, you know, Coulombic point potentials, Van der Waals forces, hydrogen bonds, electrostatics, all that kind of stuff. Um, it's more or less a brute force search with pruning, a lot of pruning. I've gotten a lot of respect for the dead elimination algorithm over time, but nevertheless, um, you know, it's 
the worst case of searching a lot. We used a lot of time on an old computer. It's still not that fast now. We can do this in about 30 minutes now on a big GPU-enabled cluster. It's a small protein. It's really a peptide, 30 residues. That's not very big. So the question that this um, brings up and what we'll explore to some extent in the beginning of this class and also later on your papers, can we use better, faster algorithms? Can we come up with algorithms that are faster, better, more accurate, design long, larger sequences and so forth? Um, so that's what I wanted to say about the methodology, namely the algorithm. And uh, what I would like to do next is talk about the experimental validation. Um, what I'd like to do now is talk about the sort of uh, the results of this algorithm. So again, you know, here's our uh, picture. Let's see, I think I have to share my screen again. Let's do that. Share screen. And. Yes. That's good. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. So let's look at what happened when we ran this algorithm. Now we know some of the input. And there were some questions about this, but I have some pictures from that. Try to talk about this. So uh, one thing that was interesting, so they actually engineered the DE algorithm a lot. And the details are in the patent. Uh, they engineered it so the size of these sets that we're talking about. So if we go back to our, um, you know, our cartoon picture here, the size of these sets here were all one. So dead annihilation in their version, because they used higher order things like triples and quads and so forth, they actually pruned it so each of these sets is one. So it and the and they converged it so the dead elimination only allowed one sequence to survive. This is very unusual, in fact. Um, now this has the term, the algorithm converged, which I think is a very poor term from a computer science point of view. Uh, it always computes a representation, but it means it gave a unique solution. And so dead elimination did this. And then what they did is they, um, uh, they built that sequence and tried it. Okay, so this is an unusual situation. I don't think will happen in any of your designs. And that's the sequence here, FSD1 full sequence design, right? So several things are very interesting about this that we'll go into. And I'll draw some, give you some pictures in a minute. Uh, the one is that it's really different from the wild type sequence. Now, of course, the algorithm doesn't know the wild type sequence, but it's choosing something really different from nature. And second, and I'll go into pictures of this, uh, it's different in other ways. It doesn't, it doesn't chelate zinc. Um, so it doesn't have these crucial residues here, these cysteines and these histidines, which coordinate with the zinc in a tetrahedral non-covalent um, configuration. Now, the other thing they did is they wanted to look at suboptimal sequence because D DE only returned one, which is kind of cool. It's the best one. And so they did a Monte Carlo simulation and looked at low energy things. And I think some of you had questions about this. They basically looked at a thousand sequences, looked at their energies. And interestingly, in this top 1000 sequences, the consensus of these sequences is also the same as FSD1, which is kind of remarkable. Now, from our perspective in this class and also the benefit of time, we can say that dead and Dead end elimination, which is a provably correct algorithm, is quite remarkable. It runs in polynomial time. The enumeration in this case is constant time, there's only one sequence. In general, the enumeration has to be exponential time because we have lower bounds on that. The problem is NP hard to enumerate. But in general, it's remarkable because it's provable. Monte Carlo simulation here is not provable. It's not clear what it's really doing. One way to reformulate this problem in the light of modern computer science is to say, great, you gave me the optimal sequence, the one that survived dead end elimination. Give me the next 1,000 sequences and rank them in order of energy from lowest to highest. That's not something that the Mayo algorithm can do. It's not something that Monte Carlo or simulated annealing can do. They can only sample the space approximately. But there is an algorithm that interfaces to dead and elimination called the ASTAR algorithm. It was developed in this context by 
Leach and Lemon, but originally for AI, robotics, and games by Nils Nielsen at Stanford. And the ASTAR algorithm takes the output of data and illumination and turns it into a search problem. And when you couple these, the ASTAR algorithm can enumerate this landscape of sequences, gap-free, in order of energy, starting with the lowest, best energy, and proceeding for as long as you want. So it enumerates solutions. And to entice you into recitations, Andy has volunteered to present that at recitation. I don't know if it'll be next week or in the future, but he'll announce it. He has a beautiful presentation on that. I won't do it in class. I just want to indicate this was done by Monte Carlo, but there's a provable algorithm. A star is guaranteed to give you the optimal solution as the first solution, and then to enumerate all the rest in order without any gaps. So quite remarkable. So we could do somewhat better at this algorithmically, but we get an idea for what happened here from the stochastic process. That's what the sequences look like. Now, I'll show you some 3D pictures of this in a minute using PyMall, but basically here's some stereo pictures from the paper to orient us. So the target structure, of course, originally had a zinc in the PDB file, right? And uh, you know what happens here is that it has to have a zinc for function. It binds DNA as part of a transcription factor. And there's a tetrahedral geometry here. So if you look at the coordination points from the nitrogens on these histidines, and the sulfurs or the thiols and these cysteines here, these coordinate around the zinc atom here in a tetrahedral conformation. Now, we just wanted to reproduce the backbone and the algorithm has no notion of zinc or anything else. And so what it did came up with is a totally different sequence, as you can see here, that when created and tested experimentally folds to very much the same shape. Instead of histidines, it uses phenylalanines. Those don't chelate zinc. And here it puts an, an, an alanine, and here it puts uh, lysine. These don't chelate zinc either. So even if you put zinc into your solution, it's not going to hold it into place. The zinc isn't even important for folding or anything like that in this case. So what this is, it's kind of a marvelous hack. And I mean that in the you know, MIT Caltech sense of, wow, that was amazing. How did you do that? Is we took a functional protein motif that actually is very important in zinc fingers to modulate protein DNA recognition and transcription factors. We said, I'm going to do this thing. It's not biologically significant yet. I'm going to make another protein of the same exact shape using whatever amino acids I want. And it turns out it's a very different set of amino acids to fold to this shape. It's not functional. It won't bind DNA. It won't bind zinc. It won't do any of those things. But it folds to the right shape. So it answers the question in the affirmative, can I have an algorithm that will predict what amino acids I need to put in a sequence to fold up to a desired state shape, at least in this one case. And um, also quite remarkable, the algorithm is provable. That's pretty cool. I'll show you pictures of these in a minute, but that's the landscape of these. Now, of course, they also can compare them. This is one a picture where they've compared the designed backbone from the experimentally determined backbone they line up pretty well. And of course, you can look at um, statistics of this. We'll look at this in some more detail. And finally, how did they determine this? Well, actually, NMR gives you an ensemble of structures or a set of structures because it doesn't give you one solution. This is because NMR actually, as a computational process at the end of the data, is actually a convolution of several different techniques. And these ensembles really convolve a possible notion of dynamics, that we haven't measured dynamics here. Um, the fact that the simulated annealing algorithm used in NMR for structure determination based on experimental data converges to local optima, could give different answers based on different seeds. And of course, there could be experimental error and uncertainty, even assignment inaccuracy. So it really convolves these all these different things, dynamics, uncertainty, stochasticity, and so forth. But at any rate, you have a set here of different things. This is convincing to NMR spectroscopists that we're really seeing a ensemble of structures that looks very much like the desired shape. And you can even see the resolution here in these models of the side chains like phenylalanine in this case here. Uh, they, you compute statistics, we'll talk about this when we do NMR, which is a great structural and biophysical technique. And another thing we'll talk about is this kind of data here. So NMR can look at distances between pairs of protons in the structure. Here's the sequence here. These patterns of distances, sorry, these patterns of distances can tell you when you have alpha helices and beta strands. So think of an alpha helix here. You have the alpha helix turning about every four turns, the atoms are near each other. So you can see that you have these 
weak distance interactions experimentally measured that tell you you really have an alpha helix. And furthermore, to get quantitative information on how the protein folds up, you have these peaks here called nuclear overhauser effect peaks that tell you that a particular proton, namely the H delta 1 proton of leucine 18, is within about 4.1 angstroms of the H delta proton of phenylalanine 21. Therefore, you can begin to fold up the protein based on distance restraints. Now, none of this should make sense to you if you haven't studied NMR or physical chemistry, but I'll teach you enough that you can understand this. And it's a marvelous illustration of how we go from experimental data to structure. It's really a constraint satisfaction problem. So um, I just wanted to show you that uh, NMR is not giving you an image of the protein and neither are any of these techniques. It's giving you indirect measurements like a series of distances and angles. So imagine you take the protein and you send out a team of microscopic surveyors and they have all this equipment and they're measuring distances between protons and angles between bonds and so forth. And based on that geometric information, you have to reconstruct the shape of the protein. That is the constraint satisfaction or optimization problem that has to be solved during structure determination. Remember to determine the structure of proteins, which cannot be directly imaged typically, The measurements are indirect, and so we have to make inferences, and therefore the armamentarium of computer science, statistics, and computational biology are brought to bear in order to solve these questions. So you should not necessarily understand anything more at this point than NMR determination was done, structure was solved and compared, but this is a promise that I will tell you at least a little bit about how to interpret NMR data and the marvelous computational problems for people that like to design algorithms and apply them to biology appear. And we'll talk about that in the next couple of lectures. Um, uh, finally, I want to mention that, um, you know, before we look at some pictures here, that, uh, you know, this is an example of using a provable algorithm so we can say something about the model. So the fact that the design algorithm is giving you the optimal solutions in the model make it much more straightforward to compare the prediction, namely that it will fold in that shape, with the experiments made on purified components in vitro, namely the NMR and other measurements, is that when there's a discrepancy between what the experiment seen and your prediction, you know that because the algorithm gave you the best solutions in your model, that therefore any discrepancy is due to part of the model and therefore you can go back and improve the model. And this is a very nice paradigm for thinking about this. And finally, as I mentioned, you know, you get lots more things to, to choose as well. So this, this having been said, I think these static pictures, you know, you may be content with them, but really what you should do when you read these papers, in my opinion, is get the actual data, really the papers about the structure, and visualize the structures. And let me do that for you, and we'll ask some questions and see what happens when we do some visualizations of the structures and what happened. So let me, let me go to that. All right. Uh, so I have a few little PyMol files here I want to show you, and hopefully this will work. Let's see that. All right. So here we have, again, this is the zinc finger. So the coordinates of this were input to the algorithm. And here what I've done is I've visualized the zinc in purple. I've visualized the tetrahedral coordination, which you can see here. So you can see these two histidines here are coordinated with the zinc and so are the two cysteines, the two thiols on the cysteines down here in, in a very precise tetrahedral geometry that's solved by crystallography. And of course, this guy here is just part of another big protein. Um, we're just looking at a motif. And, and finally, I wanna mention that um, uh, I'm gonna now compare to the designed protein when we solve that structure by NMR and notice we have a, helix and a strand here like this. But let me also just show you, um, I want to show you the entire protein this comes from so you can sort of see it. So let's draw the entire protein as ribbons, at least like this. And you can see this is actually pretty big. Um, let's see, can I zoom? Yeah, so let me select uh, molecules, select these guys here. And this guy here, I'm trying to zoom in on this. So you can see that our little motif here is just a little tiny piece 
of this big complex here. So here's the zinc finger. It's binding action to DNA, which is a pretty cool thing here. Let's uh, draw the DNA as uh, how that sticks. Um, so you see, this is a DNA binding protein, really. And so it's just a small part of the homeobox domain that's used to, for the body plan. So what he's done here is he's taken a small motif that can stably fold, and he's trying to recreate this um, for us. So, you know, so we can do it and see if the protein design algorithm works. But, you know, the thing we design isn't going to chelate zinc and it isn't going to bind to DNA, although that would be another step. So now you can see it in its natural context. Having seen that, I'm going to kill this and then go back so you can go back and see this later. Here's again our, um, our motif here um, looking like that. All right, so that's the input. In other words, the input are the, again, the nitrogen, the carbonyl carbon, the oxygen, the C alpha coordinates, and the vector from C alpha to C beta in these 3D residues here. Okay. All right, and again, I'm trying to suggest to you what you know would be good to do with your as you prepare for presentations here, what you want to do is you want to basically figure out um, uh, by visualizing the actual data, don't just look at the pictures. So again, uh, here's the solved NMR structure as Pymol draws it. Now, looky here, this is pretty interesting. This one has these nice beta, beta sheet here, right? These arrows. Now, this one's in roughly the right positions, but Pymol does not recognize this as a beta sheet. Pymol says, well, that's some kind of protein like thing going on there, but it's not no beta sheet, right? So the geometry of the beta strands here is not sufficiently good that Pymol can say this is a beta sheet. It just says it's some kind of loop. And that tells you the geometry of the design protein is not perfect. So I love this paper of Mayo. This is it. Should be a Nobel Prize winning paper. Hopefully Steve will get that. But this shows that there's much more we can do. And that's kind of what we do as people in technology and computational biology and structural biology. Now, of course, I can go into Pymol and tell if these are beta strands and it will draw them with arrows. But the point is it doesn't recognize them as beta strands. So you can see that as one place where, you know, we might be able to do a little bit better here. Okay. Let's do some more visualizations. Stop my rocket. So having looked at that, the next thing I'd like to do is I want to um, uh, basically show you this here. I want to show you the lack of sort of zinc functionality. So what I've done here is I have taken the, uh, this is again the designed protein based on the NMR data. And what you'll notice here, again, you've seen this in your pictures, Again, these are the residues drawn in sticks that were previously in the natural protein used to chelate zinc. And instead of histidines, we have phenylalanines, we have a lysine here instead of a cysteine, we have an alanine here instead of a cysteine. So, I mean, those obviously don't chelate zinc if you know some chemistry, but they you know kind of in the right general place. Right, let's think about that. It's a pretty, pretty interesting point there. Um, so I wanted to sort of show you that this is how you really visualize that to see it which I think is pretty cool. Um, let's go back now and compare the backbones. So one thing they did is they compared the backbones in order to say, hey, the backbones are pretty similar. That's pretty neat. So let's compare our backbones ourselves, do our own analysis. This will show you why we should always do our own analysis. And um, this is the most complicated picture I'll show. So first of all, I have shown here this shows the this target protein, the zinc finger. So you notice that here's its shape, and I've only drawn four side chains. I've drawn the two histidines that chelate zinc. I haven't drawn the zinc, and I've drawn the two cysteines down here like this. And then the other thing, which is drawn like this, I've drawn one FSD1, which is the full sequence design. And you can see the backbones do indeed line up more or less in the right place, um, right? They're a little bit off here, but you know they're fairly close, which is reasonable. Doesn't look quite as good as this, you know, beautiful picture that he showed uh, here, right? That's a picture designed to kind of make the point that they're really close. You know, there's room for improvement here, but let's look more at the side chains. So whether or not you want to chelate zinc, you might want the side chains to be in the right place. 
right in the right direction. So now with your permission, what I want to do is I want to um, do again, something more complicated diagram. Let's see, I want to go here and take this guy. I want to, let's see. I want to start comparing the actual binding motif for the six. So again, this is the most complicated picture I'll show you. So what I've done here, it's basically the same thing. Again, in red, the two histidines and the cysteines that should ke chelate zinc in the original protein. In FSD1, I've drawn the two phenylalanines instead in blue here. And now I've also drawn the lysine and the alanine. So look what we see here. Like you were interested in the concordance, not just in the back one, but how well do these line up? These are pretty close. This histidine rotomer and this phenylalanine rotor are fairly close by. These aren't close at all. Right, they're kind of in the wrong direction there. And that is largely due to the fact that the backbones, while qualitatively in the same position, have actually different orientations here, right? So the backbone orientations are not quite right. Here, it's you know also complicated. The lysine points out into solvent. It's not gonna interact with anything. The alanine here, of course, is, you know, is really in the wrong place. Look over here, the backbones are kind of in different situations. So the alanine is really in the wrong place, pointing in the wrong direction here. So there are really quite a lot of differences here. It's not just that in the same residue positions, instead of HHCC, I now have FFAK, uh, right? That is instead of histidine, histidine, cysteine, cysteine, I now have phenylalanine, 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 alanine, lysine. It's that the geometries of these things are off as well, not that it would chelate zinc. So basically, my suggestion to you is to look carefully at the models. Now, you can also look at the data. Of course, the data looks like, um, the data will look like this. And you may not have the background to interpret that yet. I'm assuming that no one really is a spin gymnast and knows NMR yet. And I'm going to teach you some NMR so you can look at the original data and maybe even do a project with it. So you'd want to look at the original data, which is all deposited for these systems. And you want to look at the models to see how they compare. But I think this is a much better uh, analysis of what was done and what could be improved based on these structures. Um, so if you understand the difference in models, you're doing really well. If you don't understand the NMR part, then I hope to teach you some of that later, not all of it, so you can use it. And so that by the end of the class, you will know not only about molecular design, but about the biophysical by physical techniques used to predict and determine structures. Um, and uh, I see that there's a question from Paul. Yes, yeah, Paul. just a, a quick question. Is chelating the zinc uh, necessary for the finger to like be stable in its folded form or could it be stable without the zinc? So I have to look at the data. Um, do you mean the original protein, the one ZAA? Yeah, just the original protein. I believe it's necessary for that protein, and it's also necessary for DNA binding. So it's necessary for function, which isn't being tested here, and I believe it's necessary for folding in that case. But in one case here, we've shown we can get the same shape, more or less, without using zinc, which is, you know, a little bit surprising, kind of interesting. Okay, because I was assuming that was one of the reasons why the predicted structure was so different than the original one, was because it can't do the original one because it doesn't have the zinc. Uh, that's a really interesting hypothesis. I think that in the case it doesn't, I think in the case if you took the original one and took away the zinc, it just wouldn't fold. Uh, but we'd have to look at the data again. I haven't looked at the data in a while. Um, so I don't think it's the zinc that's holding it together. I think it's, um, uh, you know, it, just inaccuracies in protein design. Uh, but they, they both could be contributory factor. We should look at the data and try to figure it out. But you could definitely make small mini proteins and motifs of this size with modern protein design algorithms based on this one that will, will hold together. So I think it's probably not a big, big restriction, but great question. Other questions? I have a question. Um, sure. So I'm not particularly experienced in physical chemistry, but I would imagine that there's at least a slight degree, um, or at least I, I would imagine that the backbones are at least slightly dynamic. So is there a possibility that the, the differences in, in those uh, backbones could be explained just by the motility of, of the backbone itself, or is that not reasonable? 
Yeah, this is a, this is actually a, a, certainly a terrific terrific question. Um, I would say short answer would be no. Um, they're they're pretty different. Uh, it's worth having some doubts about this for sure. Uh, I would say you know we don't know. Um, dynamics has been measured for the system, but not. Uh, I haven't looked at it in a while. I would say this is not really a dynamic phenomenon. This is a case of the um, some significant differences. So if you believe the NMR and you believe the crystallography, this is showing the average structures are different. Um, and I, I think I'm, I'm fairly convinced that's the case. I would be more confident if it was a crystal structure because NMR does look at uh, you know, an ensemble in some sense, but I don't think you should interpret the NMR as being a snapshot of a dynamic ensemble and it just got caught on a bad day. So I would say the differences are probably probably significant in this case. Uh, if you were an experimentalist, you would see that they were different if it was crystallography and you would call it a done day. If it was NMR, you might carefully actually measure the dynamics. You can measure, I mean, they call it dynamics, it's really stiffness of the bond vectors. You can measure the dynamics directly. And we may talk about that a little bit later and see if there really is significant dynamics. But I would say that if the NMR did its job and the crystallography did its job, then you, you're looking at the sort of modal structure and you're looking at equilibrium fluctuations around that structure, these would be larger, larger than that. That would be my, my guess in this case, but we'd have to look at the data to dig into a little bit more. More questions? Kind of related to that, um, would there be a possibility that, um, not necessarily in this case, but like the global minimum energy confirmation would match up very well with the correct protein or the, the prototype, the real protein, but um, because like D in this doesn't consider ensembles, right? But that like the average ensemble form w could be shifted away from the, the GMAC? I think that could definitely happen. I mean, I, I tend to think about this. So it's, it's tricky to validate. So we know what the GMAC is, right? It's, a, it's the best prediction from the model. And we know what the crystal structure is, which you've captured a frozen picture. And we kind of know what the NMR structure is. Is that, I mean, what's the NMR protocol? Um, you run simulated in like a thousand times. You look at the 60 to 100 lowest energy structures and you see if they cluster. If they cluster, then you take the 10 lowest. And if those have a small spread, you deposit those and declare it done. There's no reason this protocol should be the right protocol. Um, it's what's done, but there's, you know, aside from general arguments about simulated annealing and statistical thermodynamics at the, at the asymptotic limit, there's no reason that should be correct. But still, we do sort of trust NMR structures because you can see how much they do satisfy the data in some sense. I would say that the way that this would be most um, saliently experienced would be something like this. Namely, that we would um, uh, be, want to predict binding, but even though we had G good GMAX, we don't have a good prediction of binding. Um, and to me, this is because we didn't take into account the ensemble nature of proteins and compute partition functions over molecular ensembles. So it's been traditionally very hard to um, design things for binding. Uh, I have to reach across the room to get my power cord because Zoom is a power hog, but then I should be back. Uh, so what I would say is that we would see it in terms of biophysical observables that would be somewhat easier to see than comparing ensembles. And I think one way to think about this is, you know, suppose that I had a set of computational ensembles um, and I had an NMR ensemble and maybe you even had alternate crystal structures. I mean, you can compare all of those and people do, right? That's a very reasonable thing to think about. But in some sense, you could imagine someone criticizing one of those methods, like are those real ensembles? Whereas if I predicted that my, I, if, I, if I've tried to design for affinity, like design a mini protein that will bind to some 
drug target. And I do that by matching the structures and competing with GMAX. And that doesn't match up with good KDs. It could be because you never even made an effort to predict the KDs. You don't have partition functions, molecular ensembles, and so forth. So it could be very quickly validated in some sense based on um, you know, uh, the number of dynamic measurements done at equilibrium. Uh, so I would say that phenomenon absolutely would come up. And one of the issues is that you know, we don't really have a great technique for comparing ensembles. Like they could come from molecular dynamics, from K-star, from an NMR ensemble from some kind of crystallography analysis. And if they don't agree which one is right, um, and also how old is the technique. So one thing you'll see in molecular dynamics, even high profile papers is people will describe the MD simulations as an experiment to show X. Well, this is really unprecedented, right? It's a computation. Whereas protein design isn't typically called an experiment to show X unless you actually make it. So there's a difficulty of trying to compare these things I would say that what you described absolutely could be the case. It depends on the size of the energy well, how broad it is, where you're sampling, um, all those kind of things. And as I think was alluded to when we had pairwise energy functions, we're trying to capture these really sophisticated phenomena using fairly simple tools. So the way I would describe it, um, and again, stipulating that Steve Mayo should get the Nobel Prize, this is a brilliant paper. Um, but this technique and also most techniques for protein structure predictions, they're using 18th century models. So columbic point potentials, van der Waals interactions, very simple models of physics. They're using 19th century algorithms like Monte Carlo and simulated annealing, maybe early 20th century. Steve Mayo is distinguished by using modern late 20th century algorithms that are provable they come from machine vision and robotics, dead elimination. That's very unusual. That's why we're reading the paper. But most people are very content to use an algorithm that is at this point over 150 years old. And so the idea that we can be designing for pandemics in the 21st century using models from the 18th century and algorithms from the 19th century is really quite optimistic in some sense. Um, and it's not all going to be solved by very clever manipulations of the input, like which residues are hydro hydrophobic and which substitutions you need to do here, how do you handle a glycine, all that kind of ad hoc but important stuff that has to be done in biology. So there's a real debate in the field about whether this kind of field, which is really form of biology, is more like you know naturalist biology, like, oh, I found this kind of gecko and I found this other kind of gecko and this one has a red thing, this one has a green thing, and, and what do I deduce from that? Or whether it's more like physics where Proceeds from principles. And you can guess where I'm betting there is some combination instead. Um, but yeah, comparing the ensembles is really difficult. And I might be more tempted to compare to um, measurements that aren't outputting ensembles, but are giving me something with the nature of the ensemble. KD being the most obvious, but it could be stability, it could be a lot of things. Uh, it could be ITC that's actually looking directly at the, at the entropy in some sense. So the real, real thing about ensembles from the computational point of view is that um, if you do predict an ensemble and it's all low energy, you avoid a lot of false precision. Like if later you solve the crystal structure and it matches something that's in your ensemble, but only two kcal per mole above your GMAC, you could say, I got it. Like, Paul, what are you complaining about? It's, it's, in, my, it's in my model. It just wasn't the lowest one. I bet it didn't convert to my lowest one. You can make that argument. I'm very comfortable with that. But yeah, if you have a broad energy distribution, a broad energy well, you know, it's not clear that a single structure or even a discrete set of structures really matters. And of course, as you know, Professor Oss is, and, and even I are thinking about that question, you know, is this model of a single confirmation really the right model? Should it, you have a probability density function over confirmations instead? I actually think that's a really beautiful model and we'll come back to that in a little bit. So great questions. Are there other questions? I, I'm, uh, I am done with what I wanted to say. And I would be delighted to take your questions in the remaining time. And I'll also stay around afterwards for um, you know, a discussion. What did you all think I of this paper? Go ahead. Sorry, I just had a question. I was just thinking about this in like comparing it to like bioinformatics. And uh, like some like some sequences have gaps which could not be determined because of their 
specific location or region. So I was just wondering if in like biophysics or like when you're trying to uh, determine the structure, are there certain regions spawns, like or locations that are more difficult to predict or are um, more um, incorrectly predicted as compared to other regions? I think I had, I missed a word in what you said. You said some sequences have, and then there was a noun I forgot. Uh, like it. gaps. Can you give me an example? Did I show any of those? Uh, no, not in this example in particular. I was just comparing it to like, if you have like a particular genome sequence that you're trying to uh, find the sequence of, and you usually have gaps in certain regions which are hard to reach. So you have to kind of uh, sequence them in a different way. So I was just comparing it to like, I was just thinking in terms of that, like if not in terms yeah. of the algorithm. So I, I, I don't, let, let me try to answer it somewhat generality and we'll come back. So, um, I mean, there's a difference in approach between genomics and structural biology, uh, but it's not, I think what's conventionally portrayed. Uh, so, in all modern structural biology, you know the sequence of the thing you're trying to solve the structure of. And the reason we know it is that we make a synthetic gene or we clone the gene, and then we express and purify the protein and we do biophysical characterization. We know exactly what's in the test tube, right? So we know, we know the sequence at the time we do these experiments. Um, and structural biologists actually do use genomics. It's just not the only tool they use. So if you look at, I mean, I'll pick a paper of mine, I think this is instructive. So I have a paper with the Vaccine Research Center. We're one of many authors, but this is a paper on basically designing, I mentioned last time, designing better antibodies. And in that paper, the team did deep sequencing of mature memory B cells, deep, deep sequencing of the human immune system using, you know, uh, you know, 554 virus sequencing and so forth. Um, and in that work, uh, there are 10 million sequences reported, uh, about 1,500 binding measurements, 1,000 neutralization experiments, um, eight protein structures, and one primate trial. So in some sense, that tells you the relative cost and information content of the experiments in a kind of cartoon way. So, um, so we use that information quite a bit, but we're not usually very happy if we can't see what's out of position. Like we need to know, is that a tyrosine or is that a lysine, right? Because it really matters. And it, you know, in genomics, it might not, it's like roughly in the same sequence, but if we want to have mechanistic view in the structure, we really want to know about it. Um, so this is a case where we have a very well characterized system like the zinc finger. Zinc fingers are used all the time there. You know, a whole bunch of these are part of the recognition system for transcription factors like the Tata domain and the homeobox domain. And, and they're, how, they're the structural basis of how transcription factors recognize DNA by a specific binding first discovered by Carl Pabo and when he was at MIT. And we know a lot about those. They're not just genomic characterizations. We know a lot about the sequences. So those probably are the sequences in some sense. In this case here, there's uncertainty in another sense is that if you look at you know, the pictures we had, we have lots of different possible sequences that are suboptimal you could consider. Uh, it's not really a gap, it really says that there's structural plasticity there. So the main lesson of this is that there probably are many sequences that fold to something like a zinc finger. And why did nature choose one? Um, one thing that Steve showed is that this zinc finger, and this relates to Paul's question earlier, I think, it's much more stable than the natural zinc finger, even with zinc, right? So its thermostability is really, really strong. In fact, it's kind of hyperstable in some sense. And so this compelled a lot of people, including Rami Farid and his brother Hani Farid, to explore, back when Rami was at the University of Buffalo, I believe, to explore hyperstable proteins, both from extreme thermophiles, but can you make protein therapeutics and many proteins that are really stable if you boil them or leave them out of the fridge? This is an amazing thing. And it turns out that because protein design algorithms like DE only take into account the stabilizing forces, you can regularly design proteins that are far more stable than natural proteins, which is great for certain kinds of therapeutics. And now, of course, Rami Farin is the CEO of Schrodinger Inc., which you probably have heard about that makes molecular modeling software. 
So this is a very lucrative, important thing in industry. And we do it with vaccines all the time. So what I would say is that the lesson is that you can design proteins that are much more stable than natural proteins, even with the same fold, but nature didn't select them because it doesn't want them to be hyperstable. It wants them to be more plastic. In confirmation, back to Paul's point about what these do, that's my hypothesis. And also it's designing it not just for stability, but also for binding, interaction with other proteins, unfolding degradation, all these other things. There's all these other evolutionary forces that cause a different sequence to be selected. It's not just for stability. And in fact, if you design things that to be too stable, they might not bind, which is kind of interesting. Um, so there are all sorts of forces that work here. So I think that there is an interplay for sure between genomics and the knowledge of sequence and structure, but it's kind of at a little bit of a different level, at least in this lecture and the next lecture, because we are talking about five physical experiments being done on purified components where we know exactly what's in the tube. The choice of which system to use, which many of you hone in on is based on a deep understanding of biology and um, you know, the biochemistry of these things. So uh, just to put it in kind of a comic terms, you know, one of the first protein design projects I worked on uh, was a very complicated enzyme design system. We've got very good results. And I found that people appreciated the work because I thought the computational results and experimental results were great, but they appreciated the work because they felt we understood the enzyme system a lot. We understood about non-ribosomal peptide synthetases and how they can interact and how to pick a good experimental system for characterization. Just as a biologist or a chemist or a genomics person would try to pick a good target and characterize it well. So in some sense, they saw a respect for the biology as being paramount, even better than the computational results and the predictions. And it sort of made a, you know, it's a little bit of a lesson. If you know your system really well, you might be able to exploit characteristics of it. And things like that, you mentioned like gaps and things that are unresolved in the genome can be incredibly important. So I'm not sure I answered your question, but I'm certainly happy to loop back to it as we, as we continue. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? What did you all think of this paper? Did you enjoy it? Is everything clear? Would you like me to explain anything? Go into any detail about anything? Discuss your feelings about it? You think you could implement this algorithm and try it out? Um, so, Professor Donald, I had a quick question, a uh, clarifying yes. question on the algorithm. Um, this is again uh, going back to the energy world. And so just to make sure that I understand this correctly, because I'm I, I kind of like missed it on the, at the first part, essentially the algorithm will, or or the people as part of the input, they'll give it the energy well and inside of there is the discrete number of positions that the rotomer can rotate. And that's what and that's how it becomes, that's how it's given a discrete choice between how to pick a rotomer. Yeah, I mean that's I think that's essentially a good description, but it, let me be a little more operational about it. Mm -hmm. So the rotomer library is given as a discrete thing. So it has, mm -hmm. you know, 40 things or whatever it is. And basically you can think of these as little molecular substructures, right? Think of them as, you know, amino partial amino acids. So they start at the, you know, you might give the whole backbone to see how it's oriented, right? So it has a little piece of the backbone, it has the C alpha and the flanking atoms, although you're gonna mm -hmm. replace those. It has actual coordinates for C beta, and all the hydrogens and all the other stuff that's in, in there. And that library has basically, you can think of it as kind of a cross product, at least convolution. It has two different things. First of all, it has all of the amino acids, right? Mm -hmm. And it has different discrete choices for the side chains for those amino acids. And they're discrete and finite. So for example, I mean, I can go back to what that looks like for this one Rotomer library. Let's share my screen again. Uh, how do I do this? Just green. All right, let's go back to this. 
They gave us a lesson on how to not show our email and student evaluations when we do our screen. All right, so, so here's an example of phenylalanine. This is one, four molecules superimposed. So basically you'd have one molecule that looked like this, one like that, one like that, and one like that. And your library would have those four things then. And that corresponds to phenylalanine. You'd have like roughly these, I think it's, I think it's this one, this one, this one, and this one, these four different orientations in there. So you could encode this in different ways, right? You could have one and have the dihedral angles, or you could have the actual coordinates in there, and those get pasted onto the backbone. And if you had a finer library, it might look something like this when realized. But think of it as a discrete set of structures that can be represented in some fashion. So that's why the choice is discrete. And so another way of thinking about it, suppose you had a library that just hypothetically combined these four rotomers for phenylalanine and these uh, uh, eight rotomers for tyrosine, right? Uh, so it would choose in a uniform fashion, it would compare this one to that one and that one to this one and this one to that one. And then if it just did those comparisons, it would choose for that position, what it would do is it would prune at that position all rotomers of either phenylalanine or tyrosine that were incompatible with being in the GMAC. So mm -hmm. might just get it down to a couple, but it would, it would not care and what's kind of cool, it wasn't care that it's actually changing topology, changing type between phenylalanine and tyrosine, right? It's just treating them uniformly. So again, mm -hmm. well, one of the examples of abstraction in biology, you've abstracted the notion of rotomer, which is conformational change of rotational isomer to be something that's not isomeric, but actually is a different shape uh, because it makes computational sense. Uh, when I entered biology, I actually thought that there wasn't as much abstraction as physics, mathematics, or chemistry, but there actually is some, and this is a great example. Another example, and you can use this on your exams, is the notion of ligand. So first of all, terminology. Biologists say ligand, chemists say ligand. And so when I'm talking to biologists, I always say ligand, so they think I'm a chemist and they might be like a little fearful that I know more chemistry, which I don't. And I'm talking to biologists the other way around, right? So, you know, I always use the opposite terminology, the same concept, uh, something that binds to say a protein, it's a partner. So the concept of ligand is an abstraction in biology. It could be anything up to an enormous protein complex that's a megadalton that binds to some protein, or it could be something as small as a photon that binds to bacteriodopsin, right? So anything from a photon up to the largest protein complex in the body is called a ligand. So biology does have abstraction. Right, and chemistry does have abstraction. It's just that you have to kind of look for it. But this is one case like that. Anyhow, did I answer your question? Yeah, no, thank you. Absolutely. Uh, since we're at 346, what I'd like to do is stop the recording, um, but I'm happy to, I'm, I will stay. And if you have more questions or discussions about anything related to the class or anything else, please, um, please stay if you'd like to, uh, and we can talk further. Uh, that having been said, I don't want to keep anyone who doesn't want to.